Welcome to Nuclear Learning, an online initiative produced by the Stimson Center to facilitate the study of nuclear competition and dangers in South Asia. Our first open online course, Nuclear South Asia, is available free of charge at nuclearlearning.org. In this video, we speak with Linton Brooks, the chief U.S. negotiator of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union. We discuss the main operational concepts that states must consider when pursuing sea-based deterrence. Well, the first thing they've got to decide is whether or not they need a continuous deterrent. Uh, for example, in the Cold War, the United States focused from the very beginning of its sea-based deterrent on maximizing the amount of time ships were at sea as a guard against surprise attack. Now, in hindsight, that probably owed a lot more to Pearl Harbor, which, remember, was in historical memory when we started all this, than it did to any understanding of the Soviets. The Soviets almost certainly were never interested in a so-called bolt out of the blue attack. And you could see that because the Soviets took a completely different approach. They did patrols often enough to maintain operational proficiency but they spent most of their time, much of their time, um, in a alert status in port. And what that gave them was uh, the ability to make their reactors last a longer time because when you have to refuel a nuclear submarine and, and by the relatively early Cold War, both sides used nuclear submarines, now, nuclear submarine refueling takes a very long time during which the ship is completely useless militarily. Uh, so by stretching that out, the Soviets guaranteed that they would have more forces available when the war came, and they weren't worried about surprise attack because they thought the nuclear war would grow out of a conventional war. So first thing that states have to decide is what kind of war are they preparing for? If they're preparing for a very short notice um, war that could very rapidly go nuclear, then they need a concept that maximizes the fraction of time ships spend at sea. If they're focused on um, the ability to get into a survivable posture relatively quickly, uh, then they can have a different kind of concepts. So that's, that's the first major operational decision they've got to make. Second major operational decision they've got to make is how they're going to get survivability. You can get survivability from the inherent design of the submarine, and that's pretty much the U.S. approach. You can get survivability by putting the submarine in a place where you can defend against enemy ASW, anti-submarine warfare forces. And that was pretty much the Soviet uh, approach. Uh, you can get survivability uh, by um, finding ways to disguise where the ship is operating. Uh, so you have to decide in a concept, secondly, how you're going to get survivability. And then finally, uh, states have to have a concept that will work with command and control. You need to be able to assure that you meet what we call in the United States the always never uh, standard. Ships will always respond if the National Command Authority orders and will never respond if the National Command Authority doesn't order. And that requires some form of survivable communications. Uh, it requires um, different types of on-site procedures. It's, it's uh, an easy to give it as a bumper sticker. It's hard to actually do. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to click the subscribe button below and visit nuclearlearning.org to enroll in Nuclear South Asia today.